Let me read these names. Guys, I want you to, to as Joe starts us in prayer in a moment, keep these names in, in, in your thoughts, please. Bert Wilkerson, Pat Olson's your grandson, Evan Olson, who is doing much better after an, an incident with a, uh, uh, last week where he had his accident, literally about this time. Doing much better, but he needs some healing. Um, Jamie uh, Bandy France and uh, her son Luke, that I believe was born today, to Pat Hart, to Tom Lee, Barry Sells, Dorothy Setliff, Charlie Hardwell, of his, of his great niece Chloe Vaughn again, Mark Miller, Sandra Hamilton, Martin Manise. Julie Beth down in Dumas and her boys that are still dealing with uh, the uh, COVID and that. Uh, Steve Huffsteller, a buddy who's dealing with prostate cancer treatment right now. Our military leaders of the country. We need to be in, we need, obviously in, in that situation, we need, we, need, we need a lot of help there. Those trying to find this pandemic and those dealing with the disease. The real family in Russellville, Mike Morledge, Seth Olson, Robert Lee, Michael McGibney, the third, recovering from shoulder surgery right now. Uh, tough, as, tough as a nickel steak. He'll be fine, but uh, nonetheless, it's tough coming back from something like that. And I, obviously, our Bible study buddies out in Scott, Arkansas, thank you so much. Uh, Larry and Carol Grace today had to put down a pet they've had for years. And you guys know what that's like. That's tough. Kim and trying to determine what's going on in that situation. And for Nate Hill, for the doctors, anyone dealing with him with what he's got going. Joe, if you would, open us up, please. Let us pray. I gracious Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. And we just praise you for all the blessings you give us every day, for the great love that you pour out on us all the time. Carl has mentioned a bunch of names that we needed to hear but we believe that you've already been with these people, meeting their needs and giving them the hope that they need. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that brings salvation to all people. Be with us in this meeting tonight. Bless God as he uses his intellect and your, your inspiration to teach us some things that will make us better children of yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I I love that. I love that the prayer that, that we might be better children. Um, that we might be his sheep, that we might be the, the hands and feet that we're supposed to be in the world. Um <laughs> we're we're going to talk about stuff for the next four weeks that y'all know about, I promise. Um, we're in the Gospels now, which is, which is an absolutely, absolutely great place to be. I'm doing a study of Galatians with our Sunday school, and, and it's, I'm using Tim Keller's book. Um, and one of the things that Tim Keller talks about when you're reading Galatians, and you know Galatians is that towering letter where Paul really talks about faith and faith alone, that faith is the thing. Not faith plus works, not faith plus baptism, not faith plus anything else, faith. And one of the things that, that um, Tim Keller talks about is that there's a tendency for people, once they've read the gospel, to then go to Paul and to go to different things and sort of add things on. And Keller makes this comment. He said, you know, you always have to come back to the gospels. You always have to come back to the story of Jesus and who he was what he did, and why he did it. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about this whole idea of the four sons of Israel. And we've been talking about it, not so much specifically about the sons, but as a, a teaching method, as a thought process in which we can think about the construction of the New Testament, the gospel accounts, and perhaps use a, an ancient rabbinic tradition that's shown through the prayer book used for the Passover meal, the Seder, which is called the Haggadah, that introduces us to these four sons. But these four sons are a mechanism by which history, 
faith, and tradition are transmitted. And my assertion has been that just as the Jewish, the rabbinic teaching of the early post-temple period really was designed to bring the faith in and perhaps fight off, if you will, some of this, some of the conversion that was occurring for the Jews who really did believe that Jesus was the Christ. I said last week, there are those who think that the Haggadah, and particularly the Passover ritual that's done in Judaism, is almost a pledge of allegiance to the Jewish faith. That maybe the oral tradition that gets written down somewhere around 200 AD is really a response to the Christian canon, to the New Testament. But what we've done is we've, we've identified these four sons, and what I'm trying to do now is talk about how each of these sons might be, or how, maybe I'll say this differently, maybe the gospel account is actually an answer to each of these sons. We all understand and know that people learn differently. Um, the overarching theme of this study is just that. The four gospel accounts are obviously extremely similar, but they are also different. They are, we've always been taught that they are written for different audiences. Those audiences, interestingly enough, um, can also be thought of as a mechanism of teaching of individual people. At the end of the day, it's our responsibility to be the people who teach the word. It's our responsibility to introduce people to the message of Jesus Christ. Now, first we do that by our actions. And then secondly, hopefully we have an opportunity to do this by our words. But every person or any person who might be introduced to the story of Jesus, one would have to think about how we would do that. And there's lots of ways of doing it. I make I want to make really, really clear that as I begin this part of the discussion, that this, this is purely conjecture on my part. I don't, I've done a lot of research for this and I've never found anybody who's really written about this specifically. So you may listen to what I have to say tonight and you might say, you know, I think the simple son works better in Mark or vice versa, Mark works better for the simple son. When I get to the wicked or difficult son, and I'm using Luke for that, you might say, well, no, you know, I really think that Matthew would be better for the wicked son. And that's absolutely fine. That's totally and completely appropriate. The idea here is there are differences in the telling of the story, even though the story is the same. And one of our jobs is to make sure that we tell that story. And obviously we have to tell that story with our actions, but there are times when we, have to, when we have to read that story too. And it's important that that story is done in a way that makes the most sense for the person who's reading it. And so I've put this together with this whole idea of if there are differences in the way we all learn and hear and understand, then maybe that's one of the things that the gospel writers put together. As we talked about at the very beginning, there's no question in my mind that this is all divinely inspired. But there's a very specific reason that four gospels were put, were selected. We talked about, and we'll, when we get to Luke in the next couple of weeks, you know, we'll talk very clearly about the fact that Luke, in the very first chapter, he says, I'm gonna throw down my version because there's a whole bunch of versions out there. And so, God inspired absolute truth, but different ways of looking at it that might be a different mechanism of thinking. So we're going to go and we're going to spend some time. Um, as I said, the thoughts about which gospel fits which are my own, and, and you may disagree, and that is absolutely fine. That is perfectly fine. My hope is that though through this study, will help remember the lessons of our history. And I've used over and over again, the admonition of the ancient rabbis that we are to teach so that others may remember and know the mighty acts of God, that God is sovereign and in complete control. As we heard about the prayers, and I think, you know, praying on, on the 3rd of November, regardless, regardless of the outcome, we are praying for God's will to be done. 
And that's one of the things that we're supposed to do. So I hope this won't, this, this one I think will be a, a flow a little bit easier because we're all familiar with Matthew. And I'm going to go back and forth to scripture as we do this. So you remember I talked last week that the Tam or the simple son is probably the most misunderstood of the four sons because for many, many, many years, um, basically the simple son was thought to be actually someone who is learning disabled. But more recent scholarship, as I said last week, really the idea of the Tam is really the child who embodies pure and simple faith. So to this child and to those who would come after him and maybe think and understand in a similar manner, I think the Gospel of Matthew is perfect. Now, Matthew, as many of you have been taught, was primarily directed to the Jews of his time, both the Hebrews and Hebrew Christians. This Gospel was written as a story for the Jewish people, and it's an example of the promises kept to the chosen people throughout the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in fact, if you think about it, Matthew, I think better than anyone else, sort of brings the, the idea of the Jewish cho chosen people to its climax. So Matthew painstakingly describes the lineage of Jesus Christ, he talks about how the promise of the Messiah lives throughout the history of the Jewish people. Um, many would say that in Matthew's, um, in Matthew's text, Jesus is shown almost as a new Moses, which of course would be a very favorable comparison for a young Jewish person trying to understand what this Jesus guy is all about. Remember the person of simple faith, the question that he asks when when we look at the four questions of the four sons of Israel, he just he says this Hebrew word mazot, which basically means, what is this? And so he wants to know the story, and he wants to know the story as it applies perhaps to his people. Now, when you look at Matthew, most scholars put Matthew and sort of divide Matthew into five sections. And I've read this somewhere before, but it sort of goes back to that whole thing we talked about last week. One of the reasons I love to study the Bible is, <clears throat> first, I forget. And so that's great. So I get to relearn it, right, which is really important. The second thing is you always find something else, right? Every time you study, you find something else. So there are most scholars put Matthew together in five major teaching sections. And here's how they work. The first one is the Sermon on the Mount which is Matthew 5 through 7, of course, and this is maybe the most famous, right? Because it really talks about some of the central teachings of the Christian faith. So that's the first one. The second one is called the Missionary Discourse, which is found in Matthew 10. And that basically, if you remember, and we'll go through this again in just a second, that really provides the directions for the 12 apostles as they go out. The third section is the section of the parables, which begins in Matthew 13. Now, the parables, of course, are general teaching guidelines that occur, interestingly enough, after the Jewish leadership has decided not to accept Jesus as the Christ. You know that until this time in Matthew, Matthew speaks very clearly. But then after this happens, he changes, and it becomes, and the discussion becomes more parables. The fourth section is basically the discourse on the church and the church age, which is found in Matthew 18. And then finally, number five is the Olivet Discourse, which is basically the commentary from the Mount of Olives, which is 23, Matthew 23 through 25. Of course, this spends a lot of time on end times and coming judgment. So there's tons of teaching about the concordance between this and various other gospel accounts. But one of the things that's interesting is that I find that Matthew presents a very clear and concise picture of a risen Savior coming first to the chosen people and then to the world in general. 
One of the things that's very interesting to me, and this is some scholars talk about this all the time, is that in the grouping of the five discourses, you can see the hint or the, not the hint, or the vestige, maybe the echo, that's a better word, the echo of the five books of Moses or the Torah. And it's hard for me to imagine that that's a coincidence. So let's take a few minutes and walk through Matthew together, and let's do it in a way that, that hopefully does service to this simple son, to the son of pure faith who wants to know who this Jesus guy is. Um, and maybe my idea is that, that maybe the Gospel of Matthew is the perfect gospel to introduce this young man, this simple son, to the Savior of the world. You know, so beginning in Matthew, what, what does Matthew do first? He does the genealogy, right? And one of the earliest statements that, that he makes is that Matthew talks about the prophecy being fulfilled. So as a first sort of introduction to this young man, he's, he talks about the idea, Matthew talks about the idea is that, that this Jesus is the culmination of all of the prophecy about the Messiah that has been given to the Jewish people. So Matthew wants this young man to understand that Jesus came to them first, that he came to, that he is special. And he is valued. And he's valued because he's a child of God, but he's also valued because he's a child of Abraham. And Jesus came to them first. Interesting, if you go to 119, and this is about the birth of Jesus Christ, and I'll read this to you. And it's a very, very simple thing, but I think it would be, it would be really important for this young man. In 119, it says this, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. This idea of the righteous man is absolutely critical in rabbinic Judaism. It is the highest praise that you possibly can have. This man, this word is called a tzaddik. It is more than being wise. It's more than being intelligent. It's more than being good. Being a righteous man is the highest praise. And so for the father of, for the earthly father of Jesus, this young simple son is introduced to this man, this righteous man, which would really resonate with him. So in the second chapter of Matthew, what do we find that happened? Well, we have the visit of the Magi, but more importantly, Jesus is sent to Egypt. Now, you remember that one of the most important things that, you know, basically Joseph and Mary are sent with Jesus to evade Herod, right? Because Herod was going to kill everybody. Remember that we have talked about this in the last few weeks. For the Passover, for the Jewish people, there's this whole concept that in order to receive salvation or the revelation of the law at Sinai, you must first go to Egypt. You must be a slave in Egypt so that God can deliver you so that you can then become, or so that you can get the revelation, so you can, do, you can so that the law can be given to you. So it's very interesting that one of the very first things that Matthew does is he talks about the Lord and his parents, his earthly parents going to Egypt and then coming back. And so we talked about that very quickly after that. Jesus comes back to Nazareth, and in chapter 3, who are we introduced to but John the Baptist? Now, John the Baptist, Jesus, and, and Matthew basically introduces John the Baptist as a present-day Elijah, right? Someone who is announcing the coming of the Lord, make straight the paths in the wilderness, right? So one of the things that we've not talked about is in the Passover celebration, at the very end of the Passover celebration, there is a moment in which everyone stops and the youngest again goes to the door and opens the door. And that door is open so that Elijah might come in. It's expected that Elijah would come in perhaps in every generation, but we would not recognize it. But the idea of Elijah coming in is to be the harbinger of the Messianic age. And so rabbinic Jews for literally for 2,000 years have had this moment at the end of the Passover service 
where they welcome Elijah in so that the Messianic age would come in. And again, one of the things John the Baptist, using John the Baptist as a, as a current day Elijah for the announcing of Jesus as Christ, again, would resonate very strongly with this young Jewish boy. So we talk about that. Right after that, what happens, of course, is Jesus is tested in the wilderness, just as the Israelites were tested in bondage. And so all of these, we, as we sort of think about this, and then Jesus does something that I think particularly beautifully done in, in uh, Matthew. In chapter 4, he calls his first disciples. So this is 4.18. And remember, we're talking about the simple son of pure faith here. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus says this, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And then this great line, this, this line of, of incredible power, to me at least, at once they left their nets and followed him. So this simple declaration of faith, and this is, to me, this is faith at its absolute purest. They didn't, they hadn't seen anything they hadn't seen a miracle. They hadn't seen a healing. This man comes to them and says, follow me. And they drop their nets and they go. Because, because faith is what it's about. And remember, for this young Jewish man who's, who looks to Abraham as the progenitor of his entire faith, you remember in, in Genesis 16, what happens when God finally calls Abram? Basically, there's this great line saying, you know, Abraham believed God and he credited to him as righteousness. It wasn't anything that Abram did except he believed. Because that's, that faith is what, is what is the greatest gift that we can give God, is our faith and our belief. So Jesus begins his ministry now. He spends his time teaching, healing, and preaching, and proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. In chapter 5, we begin the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is, is so magnificent. Because for a young man who maybe isn't the super smartest, who just really wants the purity of his faith, he gets this idea of blessedness, right? Right? And this idea of blessedness, blessedness to be blessed in Hebrew is, to, is really to mean to be brought into relationship with God. You know, part of being blessed, part of being blessed is that you are allowed to, that you're, you're clean enough, holy enough to actually be in front of God. And so what does Jesus says? He talks about being poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted. And basically he talks about there are so many ways to be blessed by believing. And that's really the good news. And that's news for somebody who maybe loves the purity of his faith and maybe doesn't quite like the ceremonial laws quite so much. And so we do that. And then in, in 517, he says this, Jesus says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Very, very important. That's the Torah, right? That's the Torah. Actually, the Tanakh, which is all of it together, not just the five books of Moses. That's everything, right? I have not come to abolish the law and prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Again, it's really that for a young man to be taught that this Jesus came not to destroy Judaism, but to fulfill the prophecy that the Hebrew scriptures had, and to do this until all things are accomplished, and that all things being accomplished would be that his kingdom would be established on earth. You know, he would learn as he read through Matthew that he must love his enemies. He would learn that hatred has no place in the kingdom, none whatsoever. 
And if you go through chapter five, he'd learn a better way to pray. And let me tell you, the Jews have lots of ways of praying and lots of rules and lots of, and lots of prayers. But Jesus says, you know, maybe you should pray this way. This is actually in Matthew six, of course. And he says this, and he, and he gives him the Lord's prayer. This is Matthew six, nine. And I love the way Jesus says, this then is how you should pray, right? Not in front of all the people where they see you, not with your robes and everything like this, not with all this other stuff. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us because we've been forgiven more than anything else. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, and then he says this, if you forgive men, when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, then your heavenly father will not forgive your sins. This is simple and pure teaching for him. So this young man in chapter six also would learn something that would be really important. In chapter 6, verse 24, he says, the Lord says this, you cannot serve both God and money. And this harkens back to the most important prayer that we'll get to in just a minute. You remember when Peter asked Jesus, what are the most important rules? Which are the laws that we got to keep that's like number one? And what does Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and mind. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might does not allow you to worship money or anything else for that matter, right? So at the same time, in Matthew 8, he gets, interest, he gets introduced a little bit about healing and faith and maybe the cost of following Jesus. In the 10th chapter, the Tam begins to learn just how difficult this could be because Jesus sends out the apostles to the lost tribes of Israel. So let's go to Matthew 10 for just a minute. You know, it's interesting as you go along here, like in, in verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. And then in, in, as you go down through 16, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. He says this in 17, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils. But then it's very interesting. As you go through the end of Matthew 10, you see this over and over again. In 19, he says, but when they arrest you, do not worry. If you go to 26, it says, so do not be afraid of them. If you go to 28, it says, do not be afraid. If you go to 31, it says, so don't be afraid. And so he takes this simple son through all of the things that the apostles are going to have to go through as they enter the world and preach it and understand that this is going to be very difficult. But he over and over and over again says to this simple son, this young, the son of pure faith, don't be afraid. I will be with you 100%. In chapter 11, Jesus reminds him that everything has been committed to him and that his word can be trusted. If you go um, to verse 25 in chapter 11, Jesus says this, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Our young, our young boy would love this because it's simple, it's straightforward, it's not difficult, it's not crazy. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. And then he says this, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. So he's really trying to show this young man now that he is, he and God are one. And then he says this, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so as we go along in the 12th chapter, in verse 18, we hear about God's chosen servant. 
that comes straight out of Isaiah 42. And this is where God, he says, here's my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope which is one of the things that we're trying to turn around and do right now. So then we unfortunately read despairingly about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which happens in, in um, chapter 12. And then we hear the sign of Jonah about three days. And then in Matthew 15, we hear something that the Tam would find, the simple son would find really extraordinary. We look at, if we go to 15, he will say in verse 10, Jesus calls to the crowd and says this, listen and understand what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Now that would be a revelation for a young man who's just learning Judaism or who is just trying to understand who this Jesus might be. This would be because so many of the ceremonial laws are about cleanliness. And the idea of cleanliness, of course, is in order to be before God, you must be clean, you must be holy. That's the idea there. But what Jesus is saying, it's not what you put in your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth is what makes you unclean. In chapter 16, Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah. In verse, in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. What do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so for the first time, the young simple son, the person of simple faith, hears this. And, and really, this statement is, is just a beautiful, beautiful statement for this kid trying to figure out, okay, who is this guy? If we, might, if we move on to the 19th chapter, we hear about the fact that, that little children should be allowed to come to to the Lord, because this child of pure faith wants to hear that the children can come to him. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, this is uh, basically 1913. The little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus says, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them. For theirs is the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's more than just pediatric A's. It's the simplicity of faith. The truest faith is the one that doesn't question so much and doesn't have to have the intellectual piece of it all. Just the truth. Just the facts, right? Just the facts. In chapter 22, verse 37, he hears the echo of his own faith where he is told about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. That's straight out of Deuteronomy 6. This is the first and greatest commandment because everything else is based upon it. When you think about the Ten Commandments and you think about idolatry or taking the Lord's name in vain or any of those things, it's all about loving God. And this young man would love that. The second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The, remember, we learn that the, the Torah is the first five books of Moses, but then there's also the writings and the prophets, and all of these together are called the Tanakh. But basically what Jesus is saying is all of the Hebrew scripture hang on do these two things, that you should love God with all your heart, your soul, and your might, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And that is the, that is the truest way to be worshipful and to honor God. Finally, as Matthew, excuse me, as the young son goes through the end of Matthew, he'll read about the Last Supper. 
He'll know about the Passover that took place. He'll understand about the glasses of wine, the glass that, that Jesus raises up after dinner, the glass of redemption where he pays the price, the ultimate price for our sin. And then he'll learn about the passion and suffering of the Messiah. He'll learn about his death, burial, and resurrection. And perhaps through Matthew, he'll understand the magnitude of the love that Jesus has for him personally. So to me, as a young Jewish man who has pure and simple faith, Matthew is the perfect gospel for him to be introduced to the story of Jesus Christ. It is clear. It brings the Jewish story to its conclusion in Jesus Christ. It really spends time understanding the genealogy of Christ, understanding all of the prophecy that he came to fulfill and, and making it in a way that it doesn't, you don't have to be an intellectual heavyweight to be welcomed into the kingdom. You simply have to believe. So I had written down in our outline that I was going to do Mark and the Son Who Cannot Ask next week. And I think I'm going to flip that. I think I'd really rather do Luke and the Wicked Son second. And then I'd really like to do Mark and then finish up with John, John the Wise Son. It's, that's not going to change so much what we do. I just want to give you a heads up on that. Um, that is not so long tonight, but, but I really, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, and I'd be happy since we have a little bit of time to hear your thoughts um, and, and what you think and any questions that I might be able to answer, I'd be delighted to do that. Scott, I, I hear what you're saying about uh, Matthew being uh, a good avenue or applicable tool for uh, the simple fun if you are a Jewish faith individual coming from Judaism into the understanding of what Jesus was, the fulfillment of that law. But I also see it as, you know, maybe particular, I've always been a United Methodist. Uh, great, uh, my grandfather was a circuit rider. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I only see it from one perspective, so try to bear with me. But as a 10-year-old, you're going through a uh, confirmation and you're learning about the Old Testament, you're learning about the parentage and the genealogy through numbers and all the, and you know, Uncle Jesse and, and the <laughs> and, and you're learning that and it's soaking in but I also see it that, you know, at that time you're, you're of that simplicity that new genome faith that seed that you need to sprout and I think that I'm hearing that Matthew is a great clear, concise, orderly, it could be an effective tool in that mode, at least for me, and I'm easy, so. Well, I agree with that completely, um, and, and I think, again, and you guys understand this, my, my point is each of the gospel accounts have slightly different or what we're taught as we study them, they really have a little bit of different audience, right? And for most people, the, the thinking particularly of Matthew is that it really was designed to talk to the Jewish people, right? And, and part of that is as a, as a convincing argument that this man answers all the questions that they had as to who the Messiah should be. Now you can, we can all, there's, there can be some argument about the fact that, well, he did not establish his kingdom on earth. I, I would disagree. I, I think he actually did um, because he conquers death, he conquers sin, and he imputes that to us. He gives that to us. It's a free gift. It's a gift of grace. All, our only, our 
only thing that we must do is we must believe. Um, I think, Matthew, when you're learning scripture, even if you come up in, the, in a Christian household, um, Matthew is absolutely one of the most approachable. Um, even though Mark is the one that's called the peripatetic, you know, it's constantly moving and everything like that, Mark hopscotches around a little bit, and we'll, and we'll talk about why that's different maybe for the son who cannot ask, because it's action-packed. It's like watching, you know, it, it's, like, it's like watching an action movie or something like this. It's, you know, it's, it's a Marvel comic strip almost, and you, you understand that I'm, I'm being a little facetious there. But Matthew, again, the idea is different ways for different people. So if you grew up as, as a Methodist and you have generations of Methodism in your family, you're going to maybe approach things a little bit differently. Many of the people in this, in this group have grown up Catholic, and, and perhaps they would approach Bible study in a little bit different manner. You know, except for the interesting thing to me, and I grew up technically in a reform temple, but it was really probably it sort of edged towards conservatism. We really did all the holidays. I mean, not just Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I mean, we did tabernacles. I mean, we did booths. We did the whole shoot match. But I rarely, if ever, studied the Bible. I mean, we did not study the Hebrew scripture to any specific degree at all, which is always fascinating to me. Um, but for me, this was, and I, you know, would not, for me as a non-Christian, as a person who wants to hear the story of Jesus, certainly as a young Jewish boy, Matthew makes sense because it is really written with that idea. But even for somebody who's not Jewish, not Christian, not anything, but who really but they're a person who maybe embraces the idea of God and they want to know about the Christian faith and who this Jesus was, I would put forth that Matthew makes a, a compelling first run at it, um, at least for the person of faith. Now, you know, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the wicked, and, and I hate to use the wicked son, even though the word rasha, which is the word that's used for wicked, is also the word for difficult. And I think that it's far more important, and you could you can substitute stubborn, difficult, whatever you want to, to whatever you want to put in there. But I think maybe one of the things that's interesting is that we'll see perhaps a different approach to the story of Jesus that might work for a young person or any person who's learning about Jesus for the first time. Other thoughts, questions? Hey, Scott, uh, Richard here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Coptic Christians, which is the uh, probably the oldest sect of Christians in the, in the probably in the, in the world, maybe, I don't know. They came from Egypt, right? That's correct. They're based. Do we know of any? Now, I know Jesus didn't reveal himself till much later. He fled Egypt. But do we know of any any archaeological evidence or writings that have been found in Egypt that would suggest Jesus' family was there? Like any of the hieroglyphics or anything like that? Maybe I'm reaching, but I was just curious about that. You know, no, I don't have any idea. You know, the the we talked a few weeks ago about the Nag Hammadi um, library that was found, but those really, and that was found right about the same time as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but that is an an interesting selection of what became what they what they technically term as non canonical gospels, right? The Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel according to Thomas, the Gospel of, um, oh, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and so, and you remember that the, the Gnostic Gospels, the big issue with Gnosticism more than anything else had to do with whether Jesus was fully human and fully divine. And so that was one of the big arguments. You know, the only thing that we know 
about, um, we don't know much about the time that Jesus spent in Egypt at all. There was a fascinating book written by Anne Rice a few years ago, um, and I think it was called Out of Egypt or something like that. You remember Anne Rice, wrote, she's like a sort of a, uh, not a horror, but very, um, oh, what, what would you call her genre? I, I can't think of it right now. Um, but very, very well known vampires, you know, that kind of stuff, weird, sort of weird, dark stuff. And she wrote this story about how Jesus might, and it's just conjecture, right? But it's how Jesus might have been as a young man, like as a six or seven or eight year old, and, and suddenly coming, as you will, coming into his divinity and understanding who he was. Um, it's very interesting. Um, you know, it's obviously, it's like I said, it's complete conjecture, but I don't know of, of any thing that is that would really speak specifically to the Coptic Christians. You know, there's also a really interesting piece of um, archaeology about Ethiopian Jews, and that these, these are supposedly the Jews that are the son of Ham that went to different parts of uh, Africa, which is, which is just fascinating. And um, their traditions are slightly different than the rabbinic traditions, but not by much. And it's been a real interesting thing for Israel to accept that group because, you know, when Israel was established, basically what they said was any Jew anywhere can come any Jew, anywhere, no matter what. Um, as an American citizen, if you're Jewish and you want to go to Israel, you can basically automatically get dual citizenship. It's extremely easy to do. But interestingly enough, the Israelis, particularly the Orthodox Jews, really struggled with how to bring the Ethiopian Jews into Israel. Um, and that struggle still goes on. But that's not a good answer to your question. But my, my answer to, to your question is, I don't think anyone has any idea really of, first of all, exactly how long Jesus and his family were in Egypt and what happened during that period of time. You know, it really does. He goes and then it really, it, if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff that happens around the birth. And at the very, very young age, then there's a moment where he goes to Egypt, which is not covered equally in all the gospel accounts, obviously. But then, you know, really it's when he's 30 and, and it's when he starts preaching. There's not a lot of time about, you know, Jesus as a teenager, you know, or anything like that. We, we just don't have that information that I'm aware of. Maybe some of the other guys who are more scholarly or understand the Bible more than I do, but I don't think we have that information. Yeah, there was a movie came out about a couple of years ago called Young Messiah. I don't mm. know if you saw that or not. I did not. It, it, it started from the birth to right up uh, the 12 year old uh, when he was 12 and entered the temple and started teaching men. Interesting. Interesting. Kind of, but, but a lot of it was on conjecture. Uh, they showed him bringing his little sparrow back to life and stuff like that. But uh, I was just curious about that. Like, you know, it's well, you know that 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 whole the like the uh, the a bird back to life and stuff like that. That's that was contained in some of the some of the other gospel accounts, right? So there are certain other gospel accounts that do try to talk about um, Jesus and his early life, but the the church fathers and the people that not the people, but because because we believe that God inspired those people to to make sure that the right things were there right that the, that the right stuff got in um but there are some non-canonical gospel gospel accounts that that the makers of that movie and Anne rice used to try to you know create that's the only way i can say it create a um a, a backstory if you will of young jesus but we we don't have that information Josephus doesn't talk about it. The early church leaders don't talk about it. I don't think anybody really knows. Any other thoughts, guys? If not, next week, the difficult son and Luke. And then we'll go on after we do Luke. We're going to do the son who cannot ask. And then we're going to finish up 
I think with with John and you guys know I've, I've laughed about this all the time I've I've taught from Jack Sternberg's outstanding study of the Jewish basis of, of Christianity and one of the things that Jack makes this Jack makes this comment at one point that John was a simple fisherman well he's the smartest simple fisherman I've ever ever heard of because the beginning theology of John is some of the most astonishing stuff I've I've ever read it is every time I read it it's it just blows my hair back because it's absolutely remarkable. So um, I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. And you guys, let's y'all close in prayer. Whoever's going to close us, Carl, you go. Thank you. You know, Scott, you made me think about Philip on the road with the Ethiopian. When um, reading from here, basically, he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Right. And he said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Amen. Thank you for what you're leading us through right now. Thank the you. different ways to explain to different people. And I love that. Thank you very much. Nick, are you with us? Yes, I am. Could you close us? And thank you again, Scott. I'd yes. be happy to. Yeah, thank you, Scott. This has been an awesome study. And, and thank you, gentlemen, for being on here tonight. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious, loving God, we give thanks to you uh, for the multitude of blessings that you continue to pour into our lives, uh, for the way that you make your word understandable to us, the way that we can connect in a way that is, is simple for us to understand. Uh, we are thankful for this time of fellowship together as, as a group of men and women that can come together and, and study your word and, and hear it in a new and fresh way. We give thanks to you for, for Dr. Stearns and, and for his gift of sharing uh, the wisdom you have poured into him with us. Uh, God, you, you heard a long list of, of prayer concerns tonight. Uh, we ask that you continue to be with those folks, continue to give them what they need. You, you have already started long before we could think to ask. Uh, and then also with all of those issues that are not mentioned, we continue to pray for our nation. We continue to pray for our president and the first lady. We continue to pray for the healing that is necessary uh, in the division of our country. We pray for our frontline workers. We pray for our first responders, our police officers. Uh, we pray for all of those out there who seek to protect and to serve. Uh, God, keep all of us focused. Keep us all happy. Keep us all safe until we meet again. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nick. Guys, bring somebody else with you next week. See you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, God. Okay.